Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to today's Live Inspired podcast episode. So glad that you're here with me today, and I'd love to stay connected with you all week long. Could you use a little inspiration beyond just this podcast? If you could, I hope you can, connect with me. I'm very active on social media, sharing positive, actionable thoughts and videos and posts about what could be inspiring to you right this moment. So find me on Facebook by searching John O'Leary Live Inspired. My Instagram handle is johnoleary.inspires. Or if you're hanging out on Twitter, the handle there is at J-O-Leary Inspires. Anywhere that you are on social media, we are hanging out as well. And we are sharing news that is elevating for you in your work, in your relationships, and in your life. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, thank you, Joe Buck, for the introduction, and thank you, my friends, for tuning in. Now, here's a question for you. When you think of doing something new or starting something hard or finishing something difficult or watching someone else do something that you wish that you could do, where do your thoughts turn? What do you believe about yourself? Well, today I get to introduce you to the most influential photographer on the internet, He is an amazing guy, but what might surprise you about Jeremy Cowart is that growing up, his life was defined by four words. Here they are. I can't do it. I can't do it. Thankfully for Jeremy and for the millions who have been profoundly impacted by his work, his parents continually challenged that limiting belief and encouraged him to realize that nothing is impossible. We'll talk more about that. The little boy who could not do it is now a father. He's a husband. He's a photographer to A-list clients, such as The Sting, The Kardashians, President Obama, The Pope, and many, many, many others. He's launched the Help Portrait Movement to invest dignity and value in people from underserved communities who were victims of tragedy. Recently, he wrote a book titled, I'm Possible, which shares his story and challenges each of us to work with a greater purpose in mind. He's soon launching the Purpose Hotel as a for-profit hotel chain designed to fuel work for -for not-for-profit organizations. Fascinating work there. And he is our guest today on the Live Inspired Podcast. My friends, I invite you in this marketplace we all live in that is filled with so much negativity, so much self-doubt, so much focus on the stuff that really doesn't matter, and so much certainty that there are things we just can't do. Well, I encourage you right now to open a little bit more wide your lens. Open up your mind and your heart. Buckle up and get ready for an awesome adventure with our new friend, Jeremy Coward. Jeremy, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate you having me on board. Well, man, I, I, like I told you before we hit record, I love your heart. I love your work, and I'm so excited to share both with our community. So for those who... Uh, they may not yet be familiar with your book or your work. Tell us a little bit about the work you're up to today. Today, I spend my time between a few things. I feel like I'm juggling several careers. I'm still a photographer, so I still you know, shoot and do that. Um, I do a lot of public speaking. I am um, a fine artist. So I actually am having my first ever solo art show next week in my studio in Franklin, Tennessee. I'm obviously working forward on my uh, on the hotel with my business partner and our team. And um, gosh, what else am I forgetting? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's a pretty good summary. Oh, I have an online university called C University mm-hmm. where I teach photography. Well, that's seven full-time jobs. And I'm pretty sure you are a husband. You're a father. Uh, hopefully you have the ability at some point to sleep. And so we're going to be talking about these various job titles, these various roles, and what fuels you to keep doing even bigger things looking forward than you've done in the past. What surprises me in some regards most about your story, Jeremy, is is where it came from. It's that that origin story. You grew up out of Nashville. I, I think you grew up Hendersonville. Is that right? 
Yeah, Hendersonville, Tennessee. T- talk about growing up in Hendersonville. It's a beautiful little town to grow up in, kind of your normal suburbia life. Um, I was very uh, active with my family and church, and we were always singing and doing music together. And so, yeah, you're pretty typical small town uh, suburbia life. Since you are this massive creative and entrepreneur and business owner and dreamer, I would imagine many of our listeners are thinking, man, I bet he just has an aptitude for numbers and science and data and the English language. And yet your story says otherwise. You you struggled mightily in school. Yes, I did very much. Uh, I mean, I wasn't a failure, but I, I mean, I, I just was very below, well, average, if not below average at times, you know, I was kind of a a B, C student, sometimes D, sometimes F. Um, so it's not like I was total failure. I just mm-hmm. felt very, just felt very normal and just kind of blended into the background. Didn't feel really good at anything or special at anything. Um, but I was pretty content with that, just to blend into the background. So, um, so yeah, just kind of a normal, quiet kid. You, you took an aptitude test. I think it was in high school. And uh, inductive reasoning and structural vis- visualization and observation and vocabulary, you weren't hitting it out of the park. And I would imagine when you get something like this in front of you, it's easy to start to believe that you just can't do it, whatever the thing is going forward. Who, who were some of the influences that reminded you that you, that you could? Yeah, it was definitely my dad and, and mom both. Um, my dad, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, and so there's the verse Philippians 4.13 that my dad would always remind me of uh, all the time, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So when I would use the words, I can't, he would remind me of those words, that verse, and uh, it was kind of a running theme in our lives to the point where sometimes he was annoying and like, Dad, okay, I got it. Philippians 4.13, yes, I know. Uh, and so, um, but he loved to drill that into my system and uh, I think just the general encouragement of parents is really right. the biggest thing a, kid, a child needs you know whether I mean they're using that verse or whatever I just think a child needs to know that their parents are believing in them and behind them. Jeremy who, who got you into painting originally? Um, that was I think all me I and mean, then I took my first art class and junior high and then really fell in love with in high school. So I would just say the traditional art classes in school. And, and then your parents somehow say, I'm, I'm, hey, we're thrilled you love painting, but we see an opportunity for you to step into computers. Yeah, I think they were maybe a little bit afraid of me making a living in fine art, which is a good, <laughs> a good hesitation because it is. Um, and so they told me, they were like, have you heard of this thing called graphic design? And this was 1995, and I hadn't heard of graphic design. Um, uh, computers and Macs were still, you know, not new, but but certainly not nearly as uh, common as they are today. Uh, and so they told me about the Macs and got me my first Mac with Photoshop. And I pretty much fell in love with all that right away. Um And so that was some very, very good kind of intuition on their part to go that route. Man, did did it surprise you that you felt like there were things you just could not do and that you find yourself every time you put your left foot out there, the ground would appear, then you follow with the right and the ground appears. Were were you surprising yourself as you progressed forward that you were were doing this stuff and doing it well? Yeah, I I think uh, my entire journey has been surprising because I I never – I'm not really a goal person. I don't set high expectations for myself. And so I think I'm always surprised along the way. I just stay really curious and, uh, you know, I love to explore and try new things. And as the subtitle of my book says, jump into fear. Mm. Uh, and I love to, I love to go into those unknown territories where I'm afraid and scared and just try something that I, that I ultimately know nothing about. I've done over and over and over again. And I'm fired up to share some of the uh, the wild things that you've jumped into. One of the very first big leaps, at least as I understand your story, is music album covers. 
how would you even begin to crawl toward that movement? Yeah, it was kind of an organic thing. I was working for various ad agencies in my early 20s. All my buddies, you know, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, so all my buddies were musicians and would start, you know, recording albums. And so it's just kind of a natural progression for them to say, hey, will you photograph my album cover? And so it just started that way with friends. Kind of one thing led to the next. So, yeah, I launched a design company called Pixel Grazer in 2001. And uh, we really took off here locally in Nashville and we're doing websites and album covers and photo shoots and all kinds of stuff. You you had a buddy who uh, encouraged you to get a digital camera and, you know, here you are, this, this internet sensation today, you're incredibly successful in that world. And you had to go out and, and buy a book, Digital Cameras for Dummies. Is, is that a true story? It very much is a true story. I, I had taken one class in college and then made a D and nearly failed because all of the uh, technical stuff, F-stops and shutter speed, apertures, all that really overwhelmed me. And uh, I just did not think of myself as a technical person. <laughs> I went and bought a book called digital photography for dummies because I consider myself a dummy. And I was like, maybe this book will explain it in layman's terms and make it really, really simple. And it did. Um, it, it worked. But that's actually how I learned what shutter speeds and apertures were, even though I had taken a semester of photography. You know, they make it way too overcomplicated. And so, yeah, that is very much a true story. Then you start meeting with kind of like the who's who out there. You shot Sting. What was that like? Yeah, well, sometime in 2005, I um, got a, a photography job and I was up against a, a big agent, a big Hollywood agent and her roster of celebrity photographers. And thankfully, the artist that I was up for chose me and I beat this agent. So the agent calls me and she's like, hey, you just beat me for uh, this job. And She's like, but I love your work and I'd love to represent you. Do you have any representation? I was like, uh, I didn't even know that existed mm-hmm. representation. And so she started representing me. And then I see, I know I'm shooting all these you know, major Hollywood celebrities and TV shows. It just kind of blew up. Well, it did blow up. And if this was TMZ or ETV, we could spend the rest of the interview just talking about the celebrities you photographed. But I, I'd rather have you just pick one of them before we pivot into some of the mission work you're doing. Is there one photo shoot or one guest that you've photographed that something about that experience shaped you? Yeah, they've all shaped me. I mean, there's so many incredible photo shoots that I could talk about, so many experiences. I'm going to share the Sting photo in the, in the book because I was actually asked to not shoot Sting. I was shooting a live concert that he happened to be at. Uh, he was one of the artists, and uh, I was told, do not shoot portraits of the artist. Only shoot live concert photos. But I knew that was the only time that I would ever be in a, you know environment with Sting. And so I still went ahead and set up my lights and cameras backstage and got a great portrait of Sting. And then afterwards, the art director said, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad you did this because I didn't have the courage to get that shot of Sting, but you did. And so it's really a story just about taking those yeah. risks, safe risks, where it's not going to be the end of the world if you try. Yeah, I use that story just as an example to, you know, jump at the chance when you when you kind of have something in front of you that the, the big opportunity. And to this day, people, you know, will drop Sting's name as in, you know, like you did, like in your introduction, that I wasn't actually asked to officially photograph them. I just made it happen myself. Uh, there's a story in there for the rest of us. And the courage to take that shot, I, I didn't know the backstory behind it, but you have uh, like a little outlet behind them, if I'm remembering right, and there's like a light plugged into it. And the, it just, it, the backdrop of it even, Jeremy, is awesome. It's a cool picture, man. Well, thank you. Thank you. You uh, go on from there, though, and you've taken pictures, of course, of the Obamas and Britney Spears and Pope Francis, among many, many, many others. And then you start doing some work that really turns me on. You talk about the global photography movement, Help Portrait. This is a cool, cool movement that began with your own idea of what is possible. For those who have not yet heard of it or don't know your role, where did it begin? Yeah, it began in 2008 
when I had the idea to do something at Christmas where we did something to give back to people in need. And obviously my abilities were in photography. And so I thought it would be amazing to do a photo shoot for people in need and not only photos, but do the hair and makeup and the wardrobe and the whole, basically what we do on a, an actual photo shoot, you know, give them the full glam experience. We did one event here locally. It went so well and everybody had so much fun. I was like, oh man, this has to be a, a bigger thing. And so I announced it the following year on social media saying, hey, everybody should do this worldwide. And uh, it was a lofty goal, but sure enough, it took off worldwide and uh, became a global movement where photographers have now literally done this all over the world. When you were talking about taking pictures of people in need, give, give me some examples from those early days of what need they had. What, what kind of place in life did they have when you were taking their pictures? Oh, gosh. We, I mean, we photographed the homeless. We photographed cancer patients, kids in need. Uh, we photographed military vets, you name it, lonely neighbor next door type of thing. Um, so I remember photographing a girl who had been tortured by her father. He would dump acid on her face as a form of torture. And we were able to photograph her and then Photoshop out all of her scars from her dad. And as you can imagine, she was crying and we were all crying. And um, it was uh, quite an emotional day. And I mean, multiple of that kind of story times hundreds. And there's just such beautiful stories from all over the world. Well, let's talk about some of those stories from Haiti. You, uh, you began a project called Voices of Haiti. What even gave you the idea to to go down to Haiti? Yeah, after the earthquake, I was just amazed at all how the news was covering it. And they were covering the statistics, you know, how many buildings had fallen down, how many people had died. It was really um, non-personal. So I kept wondering, like, man, I want to hear from the people. I want to know what, how they're feeling, what their stories are. And I decided to go down there myself and do just that, take a my camera and my gear down there and interview the people and have them post their thoughts and feelings about what had happened and uh, tell their story through social media. And Twitter was still fairly new. This was 2012. So a lot of people in Haiti did not have Twitter. Uh, some did, but very few. But I, I had built a decent Twitter following and uh, wanted to use my platform to spread the word. I think we spent about two weeks down there uh, interviewing people and having them share their stories. It was such a beautiful time to, uh, I'm in a very, when I say beautiful, it was, yeah. I should say brutal, because it was brutal and beautiful to see all the lives lost and talk to the people. But it was a great way to raise awareness and to get the word out about their needs. And I think the United Nations ended up uh, displaying the project for a massive fundraiser to raise more awareness and raise more money to rebuild Haiti. Could you share from all those pictures that you took down there of maybe an example or two of something you captured, maybe something that they went through, but what it means for them as they stand in front of your lens? Yeah, one of my favorite portraits is one we, we did where there was a, a wedding and we could not even believe the thought of a wedding. There were still aftershocks happening. There were literally dead bodies still laying on the street since the who in there he would get married amongst all the chaos and I uh, just could not believe it. We got in our car and went driving around and got really lucky because we actually stumbled upon it. Just, just seriously got lucky. lucky. And um, the wedding was just ending. And we walked up and told them what we were doing and asked if they would participate. And thankfully they did. And they wrote on their paper plate, Love Conquers All which was such an extraordinary message in that moment at the time. And they wrote it on the only paper plate that was left over from the wedding. And then we drove them back to their tent. You know, they were staying just in, not even in a tent, but in a sheet that was hanging on a couple of sticks. You know, that was their, their honeymoon night because they had lost their home. They had lost mm. many family members and uh, they were just going to be sleeping on the ground. Mm. It was pretty powerful. Well, man, that experience in Haiti led you to Rwanda, which if you can somehow learn even more powerful stories than what you experienced in Haiti, you may have tapped into it in Rwanda. Tell our listeners what brought you to Rwanda in the first place. 
Yeah, well, I, I had been speaking at a conference about the Haiti Project, and the lady that I was speaking with, we were on a panel, and she was uh, talking about a project she had done in Rwanda about the As We Forgive initiative, where she, you know, told the stories of people who had forgiven uh, the people who had killed their families in the Rwanda genocide. So I thought it'd be amazing to go back with her and do what we did in Haiti, but with the Rwandan genocide survivors. And so we did just that about six months later. And I got to meet all these people and uh, photograph them and have them write on a stick or something found nearby what their message was to the world about that forgiveness and reconciliation that had taken place in their community. So as you can imagine, it was uh, extraordinarily powerful. And they were taking pictures with someone who injured them or a family member? I think in every case, they were taking pictures with the people who murdered their family members. Not not hurt, but actually murdered. What, what did you learn about forgiveness? Not just photography. What did you learn about forgiveness in these stories? You couldn't help but compare it to American society where we can't forget people for the dumbest of things for stealing a parking spot or, you know, for saying something unkind and, you know, here they are overseas forgiving each other for murder. It was just, and obviously it wasn't like a simple thing. They all had to go through therapy and a program to kind of understand the process of reconciliation. Um, but they did. And it was just, I think, an example to us all around the world, like forgiveness and reconciliation can truly look like. And um, many of these people were now rebuilding their community together and working mm. together, which is just uh, amazing. It's an incredibly emotional story told beautifully through your pictures and the stories below it. And then it leads to you eventually going back to Rwanda to tell another side of the story, which is the children soldier stories. And Jeremy, out of out of all the work I've ever seen you produce, I think this is your best. And that's high praise because your work is so good. And yet th this stuff is, it's unbelievable what you do. So would you share with our listeners first why you went back to Rwanda the second time and then how you captured their stories differently? Yeah, well, um, I had been doing a lot of fun art and had a lot of interest in fun art. Some friends of mine went to, uh, were doing work in uh, Africa. Uh, they were doing art therapy with kids who had, who had been trained as former child soldiers. So they were literally working with kids who had killed hundreds with their hands or machetes or rocks, and they had been forced to do so by the Lord's Resistance Army and Joseph Kony, which is a really evil warlord over there in Africa. And so my friends were, were working with these kids to train them through art therapy and to get through the, the healing process. And so when I heard they were doing that, I was like, we have to do another project um, together. We scheduled a trip and went over there and worked with the kids to have them draw their stories out. I took their portraits. They would draw the stories on handkerchiefs and draw them on my computer in Photoshop. And then I took all those uh, elements and kind of created these mixed media pieces of art that we would then sell online and um, raise more awareness for their continued art therapy. So for those who aren't staring at the pictures right now or looking at the work that you helped create, can you, first of all, explain to them what kind of experiences these kids may have come to you with? Like, wh what were they part of? What are they recovering from? Because I know part of your project was having them draw the pain of their past and then draw the dreams of their future. So what was some of that pain of their past? Oh, gosh. Uh, I mean, really, really horrific. We would hear stories of them having to murder their own parents. Um, then they would have to sometimes hike and carry their own dead family members on their backs for weeks on end um, as they hiked through the mountains. And then they would literally lose their minds from the smell and the trauma of it all. I mean, just... And it gets much worse than that, believe yeah. it or not. But the most horrific experiences I've ever heard of having to kill their mothers or kill their dads or kill their siblings, really, really evil, evil stuff. And then these little ones on handkerchiefs and then on your little 
laptop are drawing this out in their own sweet, innocent hands. And then you're taking all of these images along with their picture. And, and then what do you create with it? I, I do a lot of abstract art. So I would combine them all in Photoshop to make these kind of abstract portraits using the elements I created, using, of course, all the elements the kids created. Definitely collaboration of art between me and these children. For, for you, those listening right now, I encourage you to cruise over to our website after the podcast, and we will have a link back to Jeremy's site there. These images are uh, so tragic and so beautiful in the way you present them. So I want to thank you for that. I know that your mission in life is to explore the intersection of creativity and empathy. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I think uh, after, you know, natural disasters or major events where, you know, whether it's a mass shooting or an earthquake or a hurricane, you know, we're always going to need organizations to rebuild. We're always going to need money to rebuild. We're always going to need the World Visions and Red Crosses and fill in the blank organization. But I think what we oftentimes don't strive for is new creative ideas, uh, just creative thinking and I think Elon Musk, though he's a controversial figure, I like that Puerto Rico lost, you know, had those massive hurricanes. He's like, oh, we'll just come in and reinvent your electrical grid. Things like that. I think we we need creativity in times of need. Mm -hmm. And so my mission statement is just that creativity and empathy, trying to use new ideas, new thinking in times of need when people have lost so much. I understand that two weeks ago, my daughter and I went to a father-daughter and, and had a blast. She's uh, she's one of my favorite dates in life. Her mother is right up there with her, but then right, maybe right with her, right behind is this beautiful little seven-year-old girl named Grace. You went to a father and daughter with your sweet one, your little girl, and uh, and there with you was your brother, Mike. Talk about Mike for a moment. Yeah, we do it every year with our daughters and um uh, I had gone to the father-daughter dance uh, years ago with my two older brothers, and we all took our daughters together and um, had an amazing night together. And a couple of weeks later, I was speaking at a thing in Vegas when I got a, a call from my dad, and he let me know that my brother had just passed away of a sudden heart attack. And so he was 43 years old at the time, and, um, yeah, it was obviously extraordinarily tragic. I uh, love my brother very much. And, you know, that daddy-daughter dance was the last time I photographed him and one of the last times I got to, to see him alive. And you just never know. Um, when, our, when our time here on Earth is done, yeah, that, that was a major event in my life, obviously. Well, he took a, a grand picture of you elevating your baby girl into the air, and it's this, it's this great life-giving image, packed with love. And then you captured a single simple image of him. And it's this grand picture of his daughter's face pressed against her daddy's. And it's something that she'll always have and that you'll always have too. I'm, I'm, I'm curious how that changed the way when you are covering everyone else's tragedies here in the United States and then around the world, and then it comes home. How did that change the way that you photographed or wrote, uh, lived, loved? Father, you know how how does that change you when it's when it's in your own backyard? Oh gosh, through through a lot of different ways. One of the things that came out with it, uh, came out of it, is that I uh, I kept thinking about like what if we all were able to leave a legacy of knowledge behind? Because uh, we all spend so much time on social media tweeting about whatever politics or the food we ate or our favorite movie, but rarely are we leaving a trail of what we've learned in life behind. And so my brother's death really inspired me to kind of record all of my knowledge, um, really for my children first, but also wanted to, um, you know, document it for the public as well. And so I launched an online portal uh, education platform called C University, where mm -hmm. I teach photography and all the things I've learned. And yeah, I tried to use death as a way to grow and to document what I've learned in life. And I know it's been a really cool experience trying to figure all that out. And that a lot of people have learned from us. I'm really proud of the vault of videos that we've built so far. 
it has led to some other opportunities for you. And I really don't know how you do all that you have going on. You have a very little project right now called the Purpose Hotel. You're becoming a hotelier, man. So for our listeners who are not yet familiar with uh, what the Purpose Hotel is, will you will you bring us up to speed? Yeah, I had an idea in uh, 2012. I was walking through a hotel in Los Angeles and I had an idea to, to um, build a new hotel. And it was kind of one of those just crazy aha moments where the, not only the seed of the idea hit me, but like the very small details hit me all together. The marketing, the long-term vision, like it was like a package deal that all hit me within a couple of minutes uh, in Los Angeles at the hotel I was at for meeting. And so the idea was, what if there was a hotel where everything in the building was connected to a cause or a nonprofit? So by staying there, you were changing the world in your sleep. A hotel where every room sponsored a child and told their story. Artwork came from humanitarian artists. Soaps and shampoos came from programs like Thistle Farms who employ women from harsh backgrounds. So I had the idea, and I knew I knew it was a really good idea, and I would share with people, and everybody loved it and supported it. But I was still really, really terrified of it. How does a freelance photographer, you know, go and build a hundred million dollar hotel? So I kind of froze and gave into that fear for about three years and did do anything. Then in 2015, decided that it was time to do something about it. So. My business partner and I, his name is Michael Moore, not the filmmaker, but a different life, Michael Moore, decided to start moving forward. And so we've been working towards it now for three years and uh, we've made a ton of progress. And now we're we're moving uh, quickly towards us, should be breaking ground within the next year. Where's the first hotel? Uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Awesome. How many rooms will it be? Uh, it'll be about... 250. And from those that you've shared the concept with so far, what's been the response? Oh, gosh. Uh, I've been saying that I feel like we're an NFL team uh, <laughs> because our our fan base is so hardcore and fired up. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, I mean, people cry on the spot when hearing about the concept. People are willing to move across the world to work with us. Um, yeah, you name it. I've gotten seven years of emails now from people who are just extraordinarily passionate. As, as you look backward, whether at the, the hotels are just about ready to come out of the ground and the profound impact that that will lead to, the university that you started online, the rounds of pictures that you've taken around the country and around the world, the impact that you've had, the family that you're raised and the life that you've lived. What do you even think when you kind of shut your eyes at night and you just rewind the tape of the journey you've been on? No, just gratitude. Um, I'm humbled by it. I definitely shocked and surprised at what all has happened to me. Truly, never know what can happen. And I know it's cliche, but my message: I'm possible. And Philippines 413, as cliche as they are, they're cliche for a reason because they're true. I mean, they're stories of stories throughout humanity of uh, people doing um, impossible things. It's one thing to hear it, but it's another thing to live it and decide and to, to realize that, oh, I was just truly a really normal, quiet kid. And now I've done all I've done. And it just makes me realize that if I can do it, truly anybody can can do that. I think everybody should be really encouraged. You know, I have the great fortune of hearing that from athletes and actors and, you know, the A-listers of the world. If I can do it, anybody can do it. And they say trying to be humble, but you also recognize, well, they also had some pretty great genes and a pretty powerful network. And it was kind of set up in some regards for success. Here's this kid from outside of Nashville who didn't feel like he could do it, who has done all of this and uh, and much more. And I think your best days are in front of you. It is an amazing story. It's captured beautifully. And I am possible jumping into fear and discovering a life of purpose. Uh, when people read that book, Jeremy, what do you hope they get out of it? The stories in there, you know, there's some funny stories, some really hard stories. Um, a lot of life is in that book. But I also hope they uh, get the sense. One of the things I'll talk about in the book is how ideas lead to ideas. And so if you're too afraid to pursue that first idea that you have, 
you might not pers- you might not realize and pursue the twentieth idea mm-hmm. you have because ideas really do lead to ideas. I think people have to know that if if they get into that fear, that first idea, they might be giving into a lifetime of, of ideas. That is great, great information there. And so we have had a whole bunch of guests who've come before you on this show, and we ask all of them what we call the Live Inspired Seven. These are seven questions that tether all of our guests together. And it always starts with question number one. Jeremy, what is the best book you've ever read? The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. What was it about The War of Art that you liked? Oh, gosh, everything that book is about, the resistance that we all you know, tend to give into, and I'm certainly one that has given into the resistance. And so I really appreciated that book, uh, kind of pulling me out of the weeds and helping me get going with the work that I'm most meant to do. What is one positive characteristic or one trait that you possessed as a child, which you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? Uh, confidence, probably. Mm-hmm. Well, man, I gotta tell you, on this side of the interview, uh, for what you're doing and the way you dis- deliver what you're doing, you have an awful lot of confidence. I'm, I'm grateful for it. If your home caught fire, and all living things, your wife, your children are out, and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item. What would you grab? My hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> a practical bed. My, yeah, my, my life's work is on my hard drive. So, yeah, definitely. More. I mean, granted, they are backed up, but I definitely don't want to lose all the things I've created over the last few decades. Mm. If you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach and have a long conversation with anyone, living or dead, who would you want to have seated right next to you? Outside of Jesus himself, um, that's probably the, the given Sunday school answer. Jesus. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh, there's so many people. I look up to a lot of artists, uh, a lot of painters. There's a painter I really admire who passed away sadly at the age of 28, um, Jean-Michel Basquiat. You would be one, I mean, gosh, Billy Graham, Bono, uh, there, there's so many that would be fun to, fun to have those conversations with. Awesome. Picasso would be one. That sounds like it's going to be a, a party bench. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. What's the best advice you've ever received? Well, I had a buddy that's in my video and in the book, and the, he told me, um, hey, you should buy a camera and start shooting. Uh, well, first, he told me two years before that you should quit your job and work for yourself. I've worked for myself ever since he told me that. And then uh, when he told me, the same guy told me you should buy a camera and start shooting. And so, yeah, that's two pieces of advice. And in addition to my dad telling me Philippians 4.13, those all definitely qualify. Awesome. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? Probably just, you know, don't be afraid. You got to you gotta go for it. You, you got a lot of ideas, a lot of creativity. Just uh, believe in yourself and, and try the things. And if, even if you fail, you're still going to learn. Just go for it. Jeremy Cowart, it has been said, my friend, that all great people, and that includes photographers and philanthropists, can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? Oh, gosh. I don't really know. I just hope that... Um, Maybe he made the world a little bit better. That would, that would be great. Well, Jeremy Cowart, you made the world more than a little bit better. You are a phenomenal example to the rest of us of what's possible when we believe uh, that there's more in our lives, that it, it's that the best days aren't behind us, but in front of us. So I want to thank you for being part of our Live Inspired family. Of course. Thank you for having me. It really means a lot. My friends, that is the great Jeremy Coward. I am John O'Leary. Today is your day. The impossible is not. Live inspired. Okay, guys, I know what you're thinking. John, we get it, man. We get it. Rate and review the podcast. But my friends, listen, it really does help other people find our show, which allows us to grow our Live Inspired community. Don't you want to help other people feel fired up about their lives just the way that you feel fired up about yours? So please go right now to Apple Podcast or anywhere that you listen to your show and give us a five-star rating and then go ahead and share what you enjoy most about the Live Inspired podcast together. We can make a difference.